Okay, are we ready, Rocky? You don't care? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm here with Rocky again. He's drifting in and out of caring or not caring or wanting to lay down. Um, who knows what he's going to do. Um, but we're here to talk to you about two groups of birds today. <clears throat> we're going to talk about game birds, uh, which are uh, really ecologically and conservation-wise one of the most important groups of birds. Uh, of course, we've discussed... Oh, We've discussed how uh, game birds are important towards the funding of conservation, how hunting license, the purchases, purchasing of hunting licenses and duck stamps, uh, guns and ammunition, all contribute money directly to conservation, uh, particularly at the uh, state level, um, <clears throat> which is where the majority of our conservation in this country goes or comes from. Uh, and uh, hunters are typically the ones that care more about or have you know, traditionally cared more about the outdoors or the ones that are outside spending time in nature. Of course, that, that you know, demographic has changed over many years, but uh, they still make up a big chunk of, of the outdoorsmen of the world. Uh, and of course, you know, again, they are, they're the ones typically paying the bills. So we're going to talk about game birds as a group together, uh, particularly uh, upland game birds. Uh, things like turkey, quail, uh, even some exotic things like pheasant and chucker are all going to be on the on the agenda today. Uh, and then we'll switch gears a little bit and we'll talk about shorebirds. Um, and we'll talk about our first group of shorebirds, really. We're going to stick mainly to the sandpipers. Uh, and we're, we're doing that because we're going to start with a bird that is a game bird and a shorebird all in one. The American woodcock and Wilson snipe are both uh, game birds that are also shorebirds. So we're going to dive into, uh, we're going to do sandpipers today, and then next week we're going to do shorebirds part two, where we do plovers and uh, gulls and terns, uh, things like that, stilts, avocets. <clears throat> There'll be all kinds of uh, new birds that you haven't heard of before, and that all look very similar, and, and they'll be, that's a frustrating group to shorebirds. So prepare yourself for that, and you'll get your first half of that today. Um, and, uh, and, and again, we'll start with game birds uh, and we'll get through that and we'll have a nice discussion about that. And we'll do, we're going to do some work with game birds in lab. We're going to look at some specimens. We're going to look at how to measure them and sex and age of them uh, and ID identify them even by their scat. So uh, if you have any questions about anything in the lecture, please let me know. Or I'm sorry, lab, just please let me know and we'll uh, lecture or lab. And we'll go ahead and move on with this video that we will talk about game birds and the start of shorebirds. I hope you're all doing well, and uh, here we go. And so we'll start with game birds, uh, and they're all pretty straightforward and pretty easy. Uh, and then we'll move into shorebirds, which are, which are much more difficult and, and often one of the toughest groups uh, for, for beginning birders. Um, and we'll cover the first half of shorebirds, which is, is just going to be the sandpipers. Uh, and then we'll add in gulls and terns and uh, uh, plovers and other things uh, in the next class. So we'll start with the game birds. And in particular, we'll start with the order galliformes. These are the upland game birds or the gallinaceous birds. Uh, and we'll talk in detail about this order uh, in our lecture videos. Uh, and we'll, uh, our first family in this order is Phasianidae. There's only two families I'm going to have you learn from here. Um, the first is Phasianidae, and the member, uh, the, the largest member of that group uh, here in the eastern U.S. is the wild turkey, Meliagris gallipavo. You have to know that scientific name. So make sure you make a flashcard for that. Uh, again, that's Meliagris gallipavo. Uh, and you can see their range map. They're spread all across the country. There are several different subspecies, and we'll discuss that as well in the lecture uh, portion. Um, and in fact, we'll actually discuss that in class uh, of what subspecies I want you to know. <clears throat> um, the male is the one that's got the blue, red, white, and blue head. He's got a beard, typically. Sometimes females can have beards, too, uh, at the, at, if they've got some sort of, uh, um, or it can just be a, a a defect that the females will just have a beard for some reason, uh, but that's typically a male thing. Uh, males also have spurs, these spurs that stick off the back of their heels. Um, and again, this is stuff we'll discuss in, in class, um, actually in the classroom I've got specimens we'll look at. Uh, 
turkey chicks are called poults. I do want you to know that term. I might ask you at some point what type of chicks do turkeys, what's the name for a turkey chick, and you're going to tell me it's a poult. I want to point out a lot of these upland game birds have semi-palmate feet, uh, which is typically something we think of when we talk about shorebirds. Uh, but that uh, is also upland game birds have this semi-palmate feet, which means they just have a little bit of webbing uh, between the toes. Not a full web toe, but a little bit of toe. Uh, I do want you to know what a turkey sounds like. Hopefully you already know this sound. That's really easy. That's a turkey gobble. I don't think you're going to confuse that with anything. Visually, I don't think you're going to confuse turkey with anything. We'll talk about sexing and aging, uh, details about the head and the body and, and the female uh, in lecture, or in the classroom, actually, not in lecture. Uh, Ringneck pheasant is our next member of this group. This is an introduced exotic. They came from uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, they are introduced as a game species uh, to increase hunter opportunity. Uh, very much so in the Midwest to the Western U.S., uh, but you can find them in the East, too. There, there's some places in the East where they've been introduced also for, for hunting. Uh, a pretty large bird, uh, not turkey large, but fairly large for a, for a grassland bird. Um, a beautiful bird. The male is unmistakable. He's got a green head with a big red eye patch, a yellowish bill, a white collar, uh, and then all this spotting and striping in the body and the tail. They've got a very, very long tail. You'll see that when you look at the specimen. Uh, the females are, are, they're similarly shaped. They've got that long tail, uh, kind of a fat body, uh, but they're much more drab. They don't have any of the green or red coloring. Uh, so learn ringneck pheasant. I don't think that's gonna be a tough one for you visually. You don't have to know the sound for it either. Uh, and, and these, all these upland game birds, for the most part, these are grassland birds. You'll find them in large grasslands or small grasslands, but you'll find them uh, nesting on the ground. They've got precocial young, um, <clears throat> and they're typically found in grasslands. Uh, and that includes even the rough grouse, which would not be necessarily found in grasslands, but would be found in a young forest. Uh, so it's something that needs, it does, they do need trees around, but they need young trees around. Uh, and they don't need them to be uh, super thick either um, with the big with big trees. They need that. They need a forest to be open with a lot of young stems. 10,000 stems per acre is what we usually say. And when, we're, when we say that, again, we're talking about young trees, not old, not big trees, not full trees. Uh, you have to know the scientific name for rough grouse. That's Bonassa umbellus. So make sure you learn that. Check out the range map. They do come down here in North Carolina, mainly just in the mountains. Uh, but uh, uh, this is really typically a northern bird uh, up into Canada, all across Canada, you'll find rough grouse, people that hunt rough grouse. Uh, please don't ever call it a ruffled grouse. That's not the proper name, although you'll definitely hear some old timers call it that. Even Aldo Leopold has in Sand County Almanac, he calls it a ruffled grouse. Uh, you're an ornithologist now, you know better. We have officially accepted common names for birds, and for this one, it's ruffed grouse, R-U-F-F-E-D, and that's referring to the to the rough around their head there, around their neck. That's this area around their neck, that's the rough area. Um, this uh, The fluffy feathers, the fluffy black feathers. Uh, they, the uh, rough grouse comes in two flavors. It comes in the rufous and the gray adult. Uh, I do want you to know whether it's a rufous or a gray bird, which one, I, I want you to know it's a rough grouse. I do have specimens of the rufous uh, bird. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a tail fan from a gray rough grouse, so don't be surprised when those show up on the test. Uh, rough grouse drum. They get up on a log, they find a log in their forest, uh, and that log needs to be perpendicular to the slope. So it can't be facing up and down the slope. It has to be side to side on the slope. And the rough grouse, a male grouse will get up on top of that log and he'll start doing what's called drumming. He'll start flapping his, he'll beating his wings against the size of his body to make this kind of drum sound. There's really no other way to describe it. It's a drum. <coughs> So here pretty soon in the spring, they're going to start doing that. 
Uh, they're going to start drumming. You'll hear that out in the woods. If you go walk around, you can actually hear it pretty far away, um, farther than you would think. It's kind of subtle, but if you're listening and you know what you're listening for, you'll hear, you can hear that drumming. I used to hear them every year when I was doing point counts on the Cherokee National Forest. Uh, <clears throat> but again, they look for these logs that are perpendicular to the slope, and that, though the male will claim that as his drumming log, uh, and he'll stay on that log pretty much all season drumming. Uh, and as such, if you find a drumming log in the forest, you'll know, hey, this is a, a rough grouse has been using this because they defecate on it. There's going to be grouse poop all over it because they do spend, spend pretty much at least all morning uh, up there drumming. Uh, I do want you to know the drum. Expect that I will test you on that, quiz you on that. It'll show up. The good thing about that is it's very obvious. It's very easy. It doesn't sound like anything other other bird noise that I'm making you learn. So when you hear the drumming, you know that's a rough grouse. Uh, next up, we'll look at ch chucker. We'll st we're still in this Fazeana Day family, this fe pheasant family. Uh, the chucker is an introduced exotic, again, from Asia. Uh, and you can see it's been introduced out west mainly. Uh, and also, just like ringneck pheasant, introduced to increase hunting opportunity in certain areas. Uh, this is another one. It's the good thing about this group is they're all pretty easy to identify. Uh, the chucker is unmistakable, got a red bill, red eye ring. It's got this black line that runs down through the face and down along the side of the neck, uh, a white throat and uh, white cheeks. These lines on the side of the body, they've got pink feet and legs or red feet and legs. Uh, look at them when they fly they look really awkward um i don't think you're going to confuse a chucker with anything else that's a good thing this is the story with all of these same for the greater prairie chicken we're moving on to a different family now we're still in the order galliformes uh, but we're now in the quail family so we're in the family odontophoridae that's quail uh, and the first quail species i want you to learn is the greater prairie chicken uh, oh, and I need to point out that there is a mistake on this slide that should be greater prairie hyphen chicken because it's not, they're not actually chickens, right? They're not, that's, they're not a chicken species. They're a, a prairie chicken. So it's prairie dash chicken. We have a hyphen in there. Uh, so don't forget that. Remember that your official taxonomy page is the, is the Word document that's posted on Moodle. <clears throat> there may be mistakes in the PowerPoints. Obviously, this is one. Um, so keep that in mind. If you're ever curious, oh, that doesn't look right on this PowerPoint. Well, the official list is that Word document. When you're making your flashcards, you should make it out of the Word document or PDF, whatever it is. So Moodle, the taxonomy sheet. Uh, I want to point out the range of the greater prairie chicken. You can see it used to be pretty large. It used to take up the entire prairie region almost. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and you can see how much the prairie has shrunk by looking at the greater prairie chicken range. Uh, the dark purple part is what is left of the greater prairie chicken. So you can see how they have reduced in population greatly. Um, uh, I was you know, watching something on Facebook the other day. I, I made a comment on something on Facebook talking about, you know, we're losing our grasslands. Grasslands are the number one endangered thing. We need more grasslands. We need, and we need, we're, uh, grasslands are doing far worse than forests right now. And some, you know, some uh, keyboard warrior, you know, responded back about how there's thousands of acres of grassland in, in the prairie region of the country. We have the Great Plains. Haven't you ever heard of the Great Plains? There's literally thousands of acres of native grasslands out there. Well, yeah, I have heard of the Great Plains. And then that, person had apparently not heard that the Great Plains have all but disappeared. Uh, and if you look at this range map right here, you can see what I'm talking about. The dark purple is pretty much what's left of our Great Plains. The light purple is where it used to be. Uh, and keep in mind, uh, the southeast was historically almost all savanna-like or open uh, grassland areas too. They weren't, this was not a big forest. It's not one big forest. It never was. So that's something we can we should all keep in mind. Species like prairie chicken, they need big grasslands. And this is a really cool species. And we'll talk more about it in, le in, uh, in the classroom, in lab. I'll show you this video of them booming on a lek, this weird dance that the males do for the females. Um, it's funny. They're a funny bird. Uh, they have these big air sacs that, they, that the male inflates. They're bright yellow. 
uh, on the greater prairie chicken, the lesser prairie chicken, they're red. You don't have lesser on your list. That one's actually an endangered species, but we're not going to learn that one this semester. Just learn the greater. They've got the yellow air sacs in, in, above their eye and right uh, beside their cheek. Uh, and that one above their eye, they can inflate and deflate as well. Uh, we do have a specimen of a female greater prairie chicken, so expect that you'll see that in class and it might be on the test. Again, the male, unmistakable with that big orange sack and the big orange eyebrows, the feathers that they can stick up or down, uh, and they kind of makes them kind of look like a rabbit, at least in silhouette. Uh, so next up, we have the northern bobwhite. This is one of my favorite birds, period. I am a huge fan of northern bobwhite. It's an awesome bird. Uh, we call this the prince of game birds. Uh, it's a real pretty bird. It's a little bird. Uh, it's got a great story, uh, and it is imperiled. It is disappearing, uh, again, because of the loss of native warm season grasslands um, or early, native early successional habitat uh, is, really, is really hitting this bird hard. Uh, you can see the male there has the white head. The female has the brown head. Uh, they're pretty easy to identify. Otherwise, I, I don't think you're going to mistake them with anything else. Uh, and we'll talk about how they covey up in class and in, 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 in the lab, in the classroom. We'll talk about that. Uh, that's what this circle picture here on the bottom where they're, in a, where they're all in a big circle with their rear ends facing towards the middle. That's called a covey. It's just a group of quail. It's a family group of quail. Uh, and we do, I do want you to know the sound uh, as well. And this is what we call a namesayer. So it says its name. It goes Bob White. Or you may also hear it say Ba Hob White. That's what our, that's what the example sound here does. So again, unmistakable sound. You're not going to confuse that with anything. I don't think you're visually going to confuse it with anything either. It's a small game bird with either a white or a brown face. Um, look at that bill. Uh, you, maybe you would confuse it with chucker. They're kind of similar shape. Remember, they're not even in the same family though. Chucker's bigger uh, and much grayer. It doesn't have any of this brown modeling on it. They don't have the same pattern in the face. So, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, our next order will be the order Columbiformes. This is, uh, these are the doves and pigeons. Uh, and really today we're just going to talk about one member of this order. Uh, and we'll talk, we'll add some to that later on in the semester. Uh, but the one member I want you to know from this order right now is uh, the morning dove, because this is an upland game bird here in the, in the southeast, one across America. Uh, this is normally what uh, uh, hunters, this is normally a hunter's first game. Uh, animal that they hunt is usually a morning dove. This is a youth, a youth dove hunt is a great way to get people involved, young people involved with hunting. Uh, and it is commonly these days, the, the first place that a kid shoots, a, shoots an animal it would be a youth dove hunt. Um, you do need to know the scientific name for morning dove. It's Zenata macrura. Uh, you need to know the family, which is Columba day and the order, which is Columbiformes. Remember orders end in Iformes families end in a day. Uh, doves all only lay two eggs. There are biological reasons for that we'll talk about, uh, but morning dove is no different. They only lay two eggs, uh, so expect that. Uh, they make, there's two different sounds I want you to know from the morning, morning dove. The first is the cooing sound that they, that you're probably very familiar with. And the second is is their uh, their wings kind of make this whistling noise sometimes when they are uh, when they're when they're flushed, uh, and you've probably heard this noise too walking through the woods flushing some doves. You'll hear. Uh, so they make that noise to let others know, hey, it's time to escape. Let's get out of here. There's something coming. Uh, we're going to do Eurasian collar dove and rock pigeon. Those will be the other members we add to this family. They're pretty different. The Eurasian collar dove is a lighter color, and he's got a black collar on the back of the neck. Uh, the morning dove has these white feathers on the outer retrices. The collar dove has some similar patterning there, uh, 
uh, but I believe that white extends farther down into the tail. Uh, I want to point out the male morning dove is usually the prettier one. He will have some rosy color in his face. Uh, he has a blue eye ring, uh, a few more black dots in his back, uh, just kind of a more rich color overall. The female is usually a little bit more grayish brown. Uh, she has less black dots. So she doesn't have a blue eye ring. Uh, so keep that in mind. I may ask you sex on a morning dove, and that's a good way to tell uh, when they're in breeding plumage, at least. The male in breeding plumage looks just looks prettier than the female. All right, and now we get to the to the dreaded order, Charadriaformes, or Coradriaformes, or however you want to pronounce it so you spell it right. Uh, notice there's three different foot postures that we find in this order. Um, and uh, this is a lot of birds that look very similar to each other. A lot of brown, drab, kind of gray birds. Um, and just a bunch of them. They're all, there's just a lot of shorebirds. Shorebirds and warblers were, were my two tough groups when I was a student. Uh, you could also throw sparrows in there. It's just, there's a bunch of them and they all look pretty similar. So spend some time with the shorebirds. Make sure you get them down. Uh, we'll start with a couple of unique ones. The Wilson snipe. Uh, again, he's, this is, we're in the uh, Sandpiper family. Actually, I should mention that. This is Scolopacidae. Uh, the order Charadri Iformes, the family Scolopacidae, these are the sandpipers, and those are the only shorebirds we'll cover today are the sandpipers. Uh, I should point out that most of the members of the order Charadri Iformes lay four eggs. There are some exceptions, and we'll cover a few of those exceptions, uh, but as a good general rule, most shorebirds lay four eggs. Uh, the Wilson snipe is a game bird, just like uh, the American woodcock, which we'll discuss next. Uh, but you should always be careful if someone says they want to take you snipe hunting. Uh, you should know if they actually really mean they're going to hunt this little shorebird uh, or if they're going to just take you out in the middle of the woods and leave you. Uh, if you're here in the mountains and someone says, hey, let's go snipe hunting, the, the, you're, there's probably the latter. They're probably not taking you to hunt a snipe, to, to literally hunt a snipe. They're probably taking you out in the middle of the woods and they're going to just drop you until you start looking around for it banging in the woods and then they're just going to run they're going to run away from you and leave you in the middle of the woods i was a boy scout we did that to every new recruit that showed up they did it to me when i was young it's a rite of passage so lots of people have been snipe hunting where they got left in the middle of the woods there is real snipe hunting because there is a real bird that's called a snipe there's wilson snipe there's common snipe there's a few different species of snipe um, and you can hunt them they are an upland game bird they're a uh, they're a shorebird upland game bird, which sounds kind of weird, right? How is a shore upland? Uh, well, these guys aren't found at the coast, typically. They're, they're, I mean, you might find them near the coast, but not on the beach or anything like that. You'll find them in agriculture fields, usually somewhere with a creek running through, uh, particularly the Wilson snipe. Uh, usually you'll find along creeks that run through agriculture fields. They've got a long bill. Uh, they're, the stripes on their head go from front to back. That's going to be important for distinguishing them from American woodcock. Uh, and other than that, they're just, I think they're pretty obvious. Like that long bill, all the, the brown and white streaking. Um, compared it to the woodcock, which is what you might confuse Wilson Snipe with. Uh, the slang name for the American woodcock is the timber doodle. So you should know that. That's, that'll make a good question. Uh, you do have to know the scientific name for the American woodcock, Scolopax minor. Uh, and where the Wilson snipe had lines that run from the front of the head to the back of the head, the woodcock has lines on top of the head that run side to side. Uh, so notice that in this picture here. Uh, woodcocks are a really neat bird. We'll discuss a little bit more about that in lecture. Again, this is a game bird. So this is an upland shorebird game bird that's a weird thing that's just a weird thing uh, you won't find typically find this anywhere near a beach or the ocean you find it up in the upland areas uh, and in particular you find uh, woodcock next to alder thickets in upland areas and we'll watch the video of the sky dance actually in the classroom we'll talk about it what what that is and how that works uh, but I want you to know this sound this and this is the sound that they actually make with their wings this whistling noise uh, and then they paint the paint they make with their bill. They go paint. That's with their mouth. Uh, but the wing whistle, I also want you to know. So this is this is called a sky dance. We'll watch a video of the sky dance sometime. But this is the sound that they make.
so you heard the wing whistle there. Uh, they do that up in the sky, and then when they land on the ground, they do that paint sound, that paint, paint. They do that on the ground. And again, we'll watch a video of that in class. Uh, visually, you know, besides the, the stripes go side to side on the head, also look at the breast and belly. There is no streaking or spotting on the breast or belly. That's different than the, the, the snipe, which I'll scroll back to, which has quite a bit of streaking, at least on the flanks. Usually their belly is, is pretty white. We have a couple specimens you'll see in the classroom. Uh, and then here's just a direct comparison slide between the snipe and the woodcock. Uh, again, the snipe has the brown, or the woodcock has the brown belly, no stripes or streaking. Uh, the snipe has the more white belly uh, and might have a lot of brown stripes across it. <clears throat> and, and the snipe, the stripes on the head go from front to back. On the woodcock, the stripes go on the, from side to side. Uh, now we'll get into some tougher ones. We're going to do greater and lesser yellow legs. Uh, and these are very, very, very similar birds. Uh, if you get to really looking close up at them, you, you know, I flipped that, you might say, well, that's, I mean, they look pretty different. It's got a, this one, the yellow luster's got a short bill. They both have really yellow legs. Their bodies are almost identical. Look at the white, all the white spotting and the brown mixed together. Uh, the greater yellow legs, as you might imagine, is larger. Compare the two. It's not going to help you if I just give you a picture of a uh, yellow legs and no, uh, and, you know, no other uh, references to the size. So lesser, greater. Uh, so what we usually say to look for, for one, you see these bright yellow legs. That should tell you I'm either looking at greater or lesser yellow legs. Bright yellow, like school bus yellow legs. There are some other birds, to shorebirds that we'll learn that have yellowish legs, but they're not going to be this color yellow, this bright yellow. So no, learn that. No, that's a yellow legs. I'm just describing the bird. That's a yellow legs. And there's greater and there's lesser. Greater is larger, lesser is smaller. The greater also has a little bit of a, uh, a recurved bill. What do I mean when I say reef curve? That means the bill curves up. And if you look at this, the main picture here, and even in the uh, small picture of the one flying down in the bottom, you, you should notice a slight up curve in the bill. And I mean super slight. So slight you might not notice it, uh, but it's there. There's just slightly upturned, very slightly, versus the lesser yellow legs, which is absolutely straight. It's much shorter. It's a shorter bill, and it's, and it's very straight. Compare the two. Don't go by the color because sometimes a lesser will have that little bit of a yellowish base as well. Go by size and shape. Do what I'm doing right here over and over again. Lesser, greater. Lesser, greater. Get that image in your brain. Which one's which? Look at their range map. It's almost identical. They're very, very similar birds. So you're going to have to spend some time on those. <clears throat> Here's some comparison pictures for you. There's a size comparison of the two of them together. Look at their bills. Look at the difference in their bill. Next up, another bird that looks very similar. All the sandpipers are going to look very similar. Look at the legs on this bird. They are not bright yellow. They're kind of a, a, a dull green or a dull yellowish. They are not bright yellow. This is the solitary sandpiper. Uh, so we're looking, when we're talking about sandpipers, these shorebirds, uh, we're, we're looking for whatever clues we can find. And on the solitary sandpiper, we've got a white eye ring. That's helpful. And we've got white spots all in the back of the body, all on the upper side of the back of the body. And whether they're breeding or non-breeding, you'll see that white eye ring and the, the appearance of spots in the back of the body. That's the solitary Sandpiper. Compare that to the willet, which is much larger. Um, we call this one the mockingbird of shorebirds because it's basically all gray and it's got white wing bars that are very similar to mockingbird wing bars. Uh, particularly look at the, the second from the left image on the bottom here in this slide with the bird coming in landing. You can see that's very mockingbird like those wings. So this is the mockingbird shorebird. There's no other distinguishing characteristics. It's just all gray. Uh, the upper body, upper part of the body is just all uniform gray for the most part. Even the bill's pretty gray. The legs are pretty grayish, 
uh, yellowish gray. Uh, so the, those wings are really what we're looking for. Again, this is a fairly large for a shorebird and it's just a large gray shorebird. So that's the willet. Uh, compare that to the spotted sandpiper, uh, which I usually, this, I think students usually confuse spotted and solitary sandpiper because solitary sandpiper has the spots, white spots on the back. Spotted sandpiper has dark spots on the front, almost like a wood thrush or a, a brown thrasher, which we'll learn later on. Or we've learned hermit thrush already. So it's kind of similar to the hermit thrush spots. It looks more like a wood thrush to me. But look how long that bill is. Don't you would never confuse this with a songbird. This was at the beach and it's got a long bill. The spotted sandpiper has an orange bill with a black tip. Uh, and they frequently bob their tail up and down. It's another, you know, learn some behavior like a uh, like an eastern Phoebe that bobs its tail. Spotted sandpiper does that. When you see a little shorebird moving along the, the shore, it's way out of the reach of your binoculars. You can't really make out any distinguishing features, but you see it bob its tail frequently. Then you can assume, if you're here, you can assume with some relative certainty that that's a spotted sandpiper. You don't even have to see the spots. Uh, some other things to look for. Notice they've got a stripe that runs through their eye. They've got a partial white eye ring. Uh, again, that orange bill and the brown spots on the white background on their breast are, are, are pretty obvious. Next up is ruddy turnstone. This is an easy one. Uh, thank God. We, we, we always got to praise God for the easy ones. Uh, or bright orange feet, uh, kind of this reddish orange feathers in the back mixed with black, a big white bib, a black bill. Uh, you might confuse it with killdeer, which we'll learn later on. But killdeer doesn't have any of this red on it. It's got a big black. It doesn't have this big black smudge. It's got two black lines. They don't have yellow or orange feet. I mean, they're nowhere near as bright, the legs and feet. Um, so don't confuse this with killdeer. It's very different. It's not even in the same family. Um, but it does look a little bit similar. It's just kind of similarly shaped. Uh, but again, ruddy turnstone, it's got a lot of red on it, a reddish brown and, and those orange feet and the black bib. It's just, it's too, too unique. So don't confuse that with something else. Uh, next up is the red knot. Uh, red knots, when they're in breeding plumage, are pretty red, uh, as their name suggests. Uh, their, their underside is uh, very just red with no streaks. Uh, just uniform red all the way down. When they're in non-breeding, they're pretty gray and they look just about like all the other shorebirds uh, do when they're in non-breeding. So uh, I'm not going to do a non-breeding red knot to you. That'd be kind of mean. We'll stick with the breeding red knot. So on, a, on an exam, expect that if I show you a red knot, it'll be this breeding male, uh, which is which is all red on the breast, uh, long black bill, uh, black eye, kind of black or darkish colored legs and feet. Uh, I think red knot's pretty easy. Uh, and we'll discuss some of the unique things about red knot in lecture. It's a pretty cool bird. It's got a super long migration. <clears throat> Next up, we've got sanderling. Uh, we're going to talk about sanderling and dunlin. They're both very similar birds. Uh, when they're in breeding plumage, it's easy to tell them apart. The dunlin has a black patch on the bottom. The sanderling does not. Uh, when they're non-breeding, the dunlin does not have that patch, so it makes it a little bit tougher. Uh, these are pretty small shorebirds, but they're not the smallest. Uh, and so what you're looking for is the color of the bill, the color of the feet, uh, that black patch as well, and the shape of the bill. The dunlin, they both have black feet, black bills, the dunlin and the uh, sanderling, black feet, black bills. The Dunlin has the black belly patch. The Dunlin also has a D-curved bill. That means the, bird, the bill curves downward as it goes towards the end. Uh, so keep that in mind. Dunlin has the D-curved bill. The Sanderling has kind of a shorter straight bill. So take some time with those. And there's a good comparison slide for uh, even non-breeding plumage. Uh, next up is the pectoral sandpiper. You're starting to see that these are a lot of gray and brown birds that all just are very similar looking. So you will have to spend time looking at these. The pectoral sandpiper has a fairly long bill. It's slightly decurved, 
Uh, I want you to notice how sharply contrasted the line is uh, where it goes from the pectoral region to the belly region on this bird. Think about the name, pectoral sandpiper. It looks like it's got pecs. It's got a good clean line right at the breast, right at the, where the pec, pecs would end. Uh, and that makes it look like it's got kind of these big pecs. If, sometimes you'll see pictures of where they have this squared off shape, uh, particularly up here in the pec region. Uh, and it's this, it's just this gray color it gives it, it makes the pecs look bigger on the pectoral sandpiper. So keep that in mind, gray, uh, gray and brown and even some black streaking that almost stops immediately and turns just straight white all the way down. That's, that's really the best way for the pectoral sandpiper. Look at the legs, they're pale color. They're not green or yellow. Uh, that's helpful too. start learning the color of the legs on some of these shorebirds. That'll be helpful. Uh, here's their habitat. This is uh, where they breed uh, up in the tundra. Let me go back to the range map there. You can see up, they breed far up in the north. They breed in these tundra grasses uh, where they're easily camouflaged, easy to hide. This is a chick here in the bottom left corner of the picture. Uh, you can see one little chick kind of moving around and how well camouflaged they would be in this environment. And then also think about how small that little bird is and think about interstitial spaces. Think about having space between plants for them to move around, bare ground for them to be able to walk. If the plants are too big, little chicks like this can't move around. And that's true for shorebirds. It's also true for upland game birds. Uh, next up, we've got the Western Sandpiper. If you look at the you know, migration route of this bird, it's super weird. They'll winter here on the East Coast, and then they'll move all the way around up to Alaska uh, for their breeding. Uh, so this is a, a very neat uh, bird as far as its migration patterns. Uh, and this is the first of what we call peeps. So we have three species of very, very small shore sandpipers that we call peeps. We have the Western Sandpiper, the semi-palmated sandpiper and the least sandpiper. <clears throat> and they're all very small. They're similar to the Dunlin and the Sanderling, uh, but even smaller. And so there's a few things that we're looking for. We're looking at bill, we're looking at color and shape of the bill, we're looking at the color of the legs, and we're looking at some of the patterning in the feathers in the back of their body, their, uh, their dorsal surface. So let's start with the Western Sandpiper. You can see he's got black legs, black feet, black bill. The semi-palmated Sandpiper, also black legs, black feet, black bill. Look at that bill though. It's shorter and it's very straight. The Western, it's longer and it's a little bit curved at the end. The, the semi-palmated Sandpiper is pretty uniformly gray on the back. I mean, it's got streaking and stuff, but it's all kind of this grayish brown. The Western Sandpiper has this nice streak of reddish that goes through uh, right above the wing there. And then the least Sandpiper is the easiest of the three. It's got yellowish legs and feet, or it's kind of dull yellow, not bright yellow like a yellow legs, but yellowish, dull yellow color. And the bill's pretty long. It's a little bit decurved, so you might uh, lump that in with the uh, with the Western Sandpiper, a little bit longer bill, decurred, reddish brown streak through the back. You can kind of see the same on the least Sandpiper here. Uh, so we're grouping things together. We, you get it, if you're looking at a peep, uh, you should look at the bill first, long and decurved. Okay, so it's either a least or it's a Western. It's probably not the semi-palmated. So now we'll look at the legs, black legs and feet. It's a Western. Yellow legs and feet, it's a least. Hopefully that'll make it a little easier for you. Uh, and last but not least, we have a fairly large shorebird, uh, one that's got a very long bill that's uh, very straight. Uh, we call it, this is the long bill dowager. I want you to notice it's got a pretty brown color, very similar to the brown of an American woodcock, this light. Uh, brown. It's got a lot of streaking on it. It's got a very long, thick bill uh, and, a, and a stripe through the eye. Uh, dowagers feed like a sewing machine, we say. So they, they take that long bill and they probe into the ground and they kind of go straight up and down with it, uh, looking for invertebrates. I'm going to show you this video of them feeding. When school isn't a place you have to be, 
Why not go to school where remote learning can be as remote as you want? So you can see them pretty much moving straight up and down with their heads like a sewing machine. Long bill probing that dirt and the mud for invertebrates and other food. Here, chickadee in the background. Uh, so hopefully that'll be uh, a fairly easy one. The long bill dowager again. It's got that long bill. It's got kind of a uniquely brown color. Um, uh, so so that'll do it for shore birds and for game birds. Um, this was a pretty short video. We actually got my goal of well under an hour today, or just over thirty minutes. Uh, so that's good. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned something. Uh, next week, we're going to cover more shorebirds. We're going to start doing uh, plovers, and uh, we're going to add in some even more unique ones, some long neck stilt or black neck stilts, um, American avocets, oyster catchers. Uh, we're going to do gulls and terns, which are which is another tough group. Um, so prepare yourself. This is this is you know like I mentioned before, this is one of the tougher groups, shorebirds. Uh, so it's going to take some practice, some focus. You should really focus on this group. Uh, and they'll be showing up migration uh, here in another month or so. We're going to start seeing some shorebirds. So it's going to be awesome. This is one of my favorite groups, even though it's one of the tougher groups to learn. Uh, they're it just, I don't know, they, you, you see them, at, you go to the coast and look at birds. It's kind of fun. I enjoy it. So um, hopefully this is a group that you'll learn uh, fairly well and you'll get to know. Uh, we don't have a lot of them up here in the mountains, but they'll come through. They come through sometimes. We'll see uh, solitary sandpiper. Hopefully we'll get one of those on Lake Jay this year. Um, we've had those the last couple of years they show up. So uh, if you have any questions about anything, as always, just shoot me an email. Let me know. I uh, hope you're all doing well and I uh, look forward to seeing you in class.